Let me start off by um, asking you a question. How many of you have ever lost a case that broke your heart? Yeah, I see some hands going up here. All right, let me rephrase that question. How many of you have ever won a case that broke your heart? Okay, well, this is the story about a man whose heart was broken by doing what he had been asked to do and by winning one of the most important series of war crimes trials in history. If we can set aside for a moment the depth and scale of the human horror that took place in the Holocaust, we can define the Holocaust as a series of crimes punishable under international law. That was the challenge confronted by William Denson in 1945. Who were the accused? Well, let me start with this person. Hans Eisele was the son of a church deacon. He had started in concentration camp Mauthausen, where the prisoners called him the angel of the camp. Then he was transferred to Buchenwald, where exposure to the behavior inside Buchenwald moved him to begin cuffing prisoners around. Then he was transferred to Dachau, where the prisoners awarded him the moniker of the butcher. If you had an infected finger, he would chop your arm off. Well, Bill Denson hears about these things, and he comes to the conclusion that under the wrong circumstances, um, anyone could have succumbed to the propaganda. For him, the Holocaust was not a German affair. For him, it was a human affair. That anyone subjected to this kind of propaganda long enough would succumb. You have to remember that one of the myths of the Holocaust is that this was the work of a handful of fanatics. Well, that's not true. We now know that an entire nation was complicit and that growing up in Germany, you were hearing this not just from the government, you were hearing it from your teachers in school, from your parents, your neighbors, the press, historians, medical researchers, the scholars, the authorities of the nation were saying, this is the truth, this is the reality. These people are not human. Biologically, they don't make the grade. And it's your job to help us eliminate this contamination from the social body before they bring us all down. There's one person who sticks out for me, and it's a, a, a gentleman who is a professor now in Boston. As a young man in the, in the uh, late 30s and early 40s, he was a Hitler youth. And in his video testimony, he talks about remembering as a 14-year-old what it was like to see the tanks rolling in the streets and, and the torchlight parades. And, and I said, he said, I, I, I got a uniform. And I was thinking, this is great. I'm going to be a hero. And, and we've got the greatest nation in the world. And it's made me very thoughtful. Would I, as a 14-year-old growing up in, let's say, Berlin in 1939 or whatever, have been made of some kind of more intuitive stuff? that would have allowed me to say, no, you know, something's not right here. What is a human being to you? Is a human being a biological thing that is responsible for its actions? Well, if that's the case, then let the punishment fit the crime and let's just go home. If, on the other hand, a human being there's room in your definition of a human being for something more, something sacred. Maybe the way you practice law will be influenced by that. Maybe your feelings about the death penalty will change. Maybe we'll be moving away from a punitive form of justice toward a more restorative and reformative form of justice, as we saw, for example, in South Africa at the end of apartheid. Maybe a lot of things would change if the way we define a human being were different. I leave that for your consideration. Thank you very much.